here for this talk. I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for many years, then I become developer advocate, and you don't care about that anyway. Um, so I have experience, or in other words, I'm old. Um, and when I was young, uh, we called like monitoring, monitoring. Now it's called observability and it's supposed to have a different meaning, different semantics. I don't know about it, but at the time it was monitoring. And monitoring meant you had a bunch of people looking at a huge screen and if something happened, then they could directly do something. That was, that was regular alerting. Now you have tools to do that. At the time, everything was manual. I actually was quite lucky to be on site at the customer site where it was supposed to be the biggest on screen monitoring of all friends. Uh, it was uh, an organization that was supposed to give out an um, unemployment uh, money. So basically, you can imagine in France, it's a lot of money. And um, well, I they, they were super proud to say we have the biggest wall screen. Great. Um, but actually, this is good and dandy, but systems nowadays are distributed. I even if you don't do microservices, you have distributed services. It can be API calls, it can like be uh, a message queue, it can be anything, but all the systems are distributed. So it's not enough to just look at the screen and try to like assume something. Here is the definition of observability uh, on Wikipedia. And basically, this is based on three pillars. So just so you, we are on the same page, this talk is for developers, how to help your ops colleague. But I will still have an overview on observability. Then I will talk a bit about distributed tracing itself, which in my opinion is the most overlooked component. And then I will show you how you can do it in different stacks. And then I can, you can vote which stack is the most interesting. So metrics, metrics is what we started with. Um, we started with CPU, we've started with uh, like uh, memory, with storage. This is done. Every, 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 if you don't, know, don't do it now, you're in deep trouble. You should like leave the company. It's not, not a great company because we already did it in the past. On the, on the subject of metrics, however, you can probably now be more useful if you observe like higher level metrics, metrics that are more relevant to the business, like transactions per second, uh, number of dropped cards, if you, uh, if you work in e-commerce, this kind of stuff. However, it's just the nature of the metric, but the metric itself is done. Logging. Interestingly enough, I thought logging was also a solved problem, but when you talk to people, it's not always the case. So again, I'm talking to developers who actually make decision on such logging solution, but in the end, it will be the ops that operate the stuff. The first, very stupid, what do you log? Do you log manually, which is a, like a big burden on the developers? Uh, you need to provide them guidelines, you need to prove what they log, or you automate the logging. I did that when I was, again, younger. I had a Java agent, I automated like the logging. Every time you enter a method, I logged the parameters. Every time you exit it, I logged the return value. That was not very smart, right? But it was low effort. In general, if you have been working in Java for a long time or in any developer capacity in any stack, by the way, uh, you are used to, to, to write your log in a human understandable format. So you have uh, SLF4G, Log4G, Log4G2, I don't know, and you have the regular format. You might customize it a bit, but not that much. However, most of the time, those logs, they are not meant to, read, to be read by humans directly on the system. They are meant to be sent and processed in a centralized logging location. And this generally requires JSON. So you need an additional layer of processing that is completely userless. So if you are using uh, uh, the ELK stack, there is um, 
log stash that does it. You need to process it. You have the, Greg, the grok pattern and you process it in JSON. Takes energy. It's an additional component in your architecture. Just output the JSON directly. You can do it directly from your logging framework. Again, when I was younger, I was forbidden to log on the console. That was forbidden. Now we have containers. Where do we log? On the console. And then finally, you need, absolutely need to have a log aggregation component somewhere. More questions. Is it push or pull? Does your application pushes the log somewhere? Does it provide the log to be scraped by something else? You need to think about it. As I mentioned already, parsing the log, having an additional por log parsing um, step is in general inevitable if you don't have the right log format. So provide the format directly in the right format. Then you need to think about storing the log, how long, how do you remove them? How much do you pay? I've never used it, but I know data log customers. I mean, they are not always happy about the billing in the end because of the storage. Uh, and then the most important part is how do you search the logs? I am more familiar with um, the Elk stack, which I have used in the past, but there are many, many different solutions that are available on premise, managed service, whatever. Just think about it. Then finally, there is tracing. And as I mentioned, I believe tracing is the most overlooked problem that we have. And still is the third pillar of observability. I love Wikipedia definition. This one, I don't like it so much, actually. So I came up with my own, probably inspired by many good others. Um, and the idea is, when you have a distributed system and you somehow send a request, it goes through different components. And distributed tracing is a way to follow this business transaction throughout all the components. So that if something happens, and something will happen at one point, you know at least where it stopped and why. And then sometimes you might also have like links to the metrics and to the logs. There were tracing pioneers like Zimkin and Jaeger. Does the name ring a bell for anybody? Yeah, everybody is there. Okay, great. And then open tracing as well. I will just mention it later because it's one of the few success of merging in open source, I believe. However, if we want as an industry to be more productive, we need a specification and not uh, another standard like in the... Oh, ooh. Oh, it lags a lot. I in the XKCD comics, like, hey, we have 14 standards, we will create one more to unite them all, and then you have 15 standards, but a real standard. In general, there are some organizations that are better suited for this. Here is a W3C, and it created this trace context specification that you can rely on. And the idea is pretty stupid, right? There is nothing, that m m not great engineering behind, it's just like common sense. So basically you have a trace and the trace is a business transaction across your system. And then you have a span and the span is what happens inside one of the component for this trace. And because the diagram beats everything, here you have a trace. I will try it again. Oof. Yeah, you have a single trace. Well, let's forget it. Uh, you have a single trace. And here, this is the whole transaction. And it goes through three components, x, y, and z. And so it goes through x. Then x calls onto y and z. And those are the spans and the whole constitutes the trace. Specification is nice, but you need an implementation. And again, if you have one single 
specification and many different implementations that sometimes are not compatible with one another. Yeah, it looks strange, but it's the case. It's not that great. So basically, now we have something called Open Telemetry, which is an open source project that uses the specification, but not only, to provide like a, s a set of tools and libraries and components that help you implement these traces, these distributed traces. So as I mentioned, it implements the trace context. It is a merge of open tracing and open census, which again, I believe is a very, very, very good example of one of the few ones that is a successful merging of two projects. So if you are using uh, open tracing, just forget it. Use open telemetry, it's the successor. It is a CNCF project, which is like good credibility. It has many, many followers on GitHub and it has the friendly Apache V2 license. Open telemetry actually doesn't do much by itself. It's... Uh, <laughs> I will never get it working. It specified the open telemetry protocol and the format, and that's all. It also provides, but only as an example, an hotel collector. There are many different other collectors that are compatible with the protocol and the formats. So it's just, you can use this one, you can use other ones. What happens at the source is not their problem. What happens afterwards is especially not their problem. So, for example, how the data is stored inside the hotel collector, that it's not, it's not their problem. However, on the source, they will provide the SDK, the API, the whatever, to let you send data in the right formats on with the right protocol. If you are already using Zipkin and Jaeger, it means that now, since they are compatible, you can continue using those like components and just switch on the open telemetry collector to change how the data is collected. So you can reuse your existing uh, tracing infrastructure, which I believe is a great, great benefit. You don't need to change anything. You just say, hey, now I'm open to open telemetry protocol, send me the data in this format, and then you can send the data in hotel. Now from the developer perspective, there are two main approaches. First approach is auto-instrumentation. It's only possible if you are using a runtime, such as the GVM or the Python runtime. If you are using Rust, no auto-instrumentation. And if you are not using auto-instrumentation, you can use manual instrumentation. Again, inside manual instrumentation, you have different approaches. You can call the API or you can use some annotations with Spring, for example. So this is the first decision. I believe auto-instrumentation is a very low-hanging fruit. You will just add, for example, in Java, the agent, or in Python, a wrapper, and then your code will send data to your hotel collector. It might not be exactly the result what you want, but for the effort involved, it's the best ratio ever. So do it at first. As a side effect, as a, a side benefit, your developers don't need to change anything. They don't need an additional dependency. They ne don't need to change their code. It works out of the box. I will show you an example. Here I will have like an e-commerce example, which based on like a couple of components, you can call that microservices or not, I don't care, at least it's distributed architecture. So first I will have the entry point, which in my case is an API getaway. The API getaway will forward the request to the product, and then I will need to enrich the product data with the pricing and the stocks. That's very simple demo, but it gives you a good overview of a regular distributed architecture. I believe the most important entry point, uh, and the most important component is the entry point. In that case, is the API gateway. 
I work on the Apache API 6 project, as you can see from my t-shirt, which is an Apache Foundation Managed API Gateway. It's based on Nginx. Who here knows about Nginx? Great, everybody. So it's very solid, it's open source. Then we have OpenResty on top, because one of the issues about Nginx is that it was designed at a time where changing the configuration and like switching it off and on again was not an issue. So you need to have a way to change the configuration dynamically while keeping the service running. Because again, it's the entry point to your information system. So OpenResty is such a project. It's a Lua based project where you can change the configuration, the running configuration of Nginx in Lua. Then you have the uh, API 6 core, and then we offer a plugin based platform. So you can, for different routes, have different plugins. Um, and then I will show the demo because otherwise it's just the slide that I can give you afterwards. Is it big enough for everybody to see? Yeah, okay, so if in the back it's big enough, in the front it should be big enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm a very good engineer. Docker Compose up, and then I can describe the stuff. So here I have Jaeger. I have no preference for Jaeger instead of Zipkin or anything else. It's just that in this case, it gives me a single Docker image for everything. I don't need to think about all the different components inside. It's the most comfortable for me since I'm not an expert. Then I have API 6. API 6, I configure it, uh, I configure it with uh, like static file. Then I have my catalog. Then I have my pricing. And here I have the stock. So now is the important question. The catalog, I coded it with Spring Boot and Kotlin. The pricing is in Python with Flask. And stock is Rust with Axum. Who, I can describe a couple of them, all of them. Who is interested in the Spring Boot Kotlin? I believe since it's Java conference, nobody. Wow. Python? Even less, one person, Rust. Oh, amazing. I'm impressed and I'm very uncomfortable This ac actually this one that I know less. So I will start with it anyway. Um, so here I have my uh, Tommel. So if I, I will need to describe it, so basically uh, in uh, uh, the REST ecosystem, there is this Axum Asynchronous Framework. That is, sorry, Tokyo is the Asynchronous Framework and Axum is the like web framework that is built on top of Tokyo. And then I had to find the open telemetry libraries and I had to find also the library, which is <laughs> not very easy to use. It's a community provided one that plays well with open telemetry and Axum. And at the moment I'm using this one. They change, they are very dynamic. They change the code regularly. Um, the, s the, the code itself before here, I have something to shut down everything before the code was much, much longer. I had to do like other things. Now they implemented inside the framework. Now for the code itself, Here I have my main function. I annotate it with Tokyo main so I can use this async stuff. Then I have my regular router where I say I have this route. So basically here I have one single route. I need to query my stock product by product, which is pretty stupid, but hey, it's a demo. And then <coughs> I have the response and the open telemetry layer. So basically when you are using Axum, you can add additional layers if you are a Spring Boot developer or at least a, um, a, a Java E developer. You can think about it like filters afterwards. So it's post-processing or pre-processing. Then I start the server and I have this additional like copy-pasted code, like how to shut down the stuff and it's done. The only thing that I need to do is to provide when I get the product by its ID, what uh, function it will call and this is this one 
and I'm not using any database. I've just like hard coded everything into uh, this gigantic map, which is okay, again for a demo, and I just return the stuff. And that's all. So I, I also, yeah, I, I pass a random quantity because I just want to have fun, but that's not very important. So that's on the side. Here I'm using Rust, everything is compiled. So again, I need to provide dependency at compile time. There is no platform and the Docker file on the opposite is very simple. I had to install a couple of additional dependency. Otherwise it's just regular. You build your stuff, you run your stuff. And this is a multi-stage Docker build. So the first one, I I'm using a uh, Rust image. The second one, I start from uh, I start from scratch, and I have a very isolated, bare minimum image. I love starting from scratch. I can show off. Okay, that's done. Uh, and the second one, I think there was one Python interested and a couple of Spring Boot. So I will go to Spring Boot. Um, as I mentioned, it's a Spring Boot application. I'm using uh, like reactive stuff because everybody uses reactive, even if you don't need it. And I love Kotlin, so I'm also using Kotlin. Nothing wrong with it, it's just like basic stuff. I'm using uh, R2DBC because I don't need anything more uh, complex for this application, for this demo. However, on the Docker file, it's where the magic, uh, sorry. Where was I on the Docker file here? It's where the magic happens. So I'm also building it, but when I'm using the, the, the runtime image, I add this additional dependency. So during build time, I add the dependency on the Docker image and it's a Java agent. And because Java allows me to have this Java agent, when I run the stuff, I pass the Java agent. So again, here on the POM, there is nothing that is open telemetry related. I push this concern to the build phase. And now I can curl. Okay, the result is not interesting. And then I can check on the Jaeger UI. And here I can see the request that flows through all the components. So something interesting, for example, here we can check that the API gateway is the first component to receive the request, which is expected. Then it forwards it to the catalog. The catalog, inside the catalog, we see several spans. That's because Spring is already like open telemetry compatible and without any configuration, there is not one single span in the whole component, but a succession of span that you can further customize with manual instrumentation that we will see just afterwards. Then we can see that the catalog makes a GET request to the stock, but when the catalog makes a pricing request, it goes through the API gateway again. So even if you are not using this open telemetry to actually like observe your stack, it can give you pretty good insight because perhaps there is a misconfiguration. Perhaps I never wanted to go to the API gateway again. Perhaps I wanted to always go to the API gateway again, but now I have two services that I don't treat the same way. So this is a good insight. Something that might be interesting as well is here you have the two get request, the first one to the stock, the second one to the pricing through the API gateway, and we can see that they are parallel. So I'm not a very good at like this parallel stuff, but that's actually what I wanted to do because I I I'm using like coroutines, the Kotlin coroutines, and so I wanted to have this parallel. And yes, I have confirmation, even though I'm not an expert, I achieved what I wanted. 
on the API Gateway side, we have several configuration as well. The first one is, sorry, not this one, this one. You can say that, so as I mentioned, on API 6, you have a plugin-based architecture. So on every route, you could potentially add the plugins. But my idea is I want every route to be observed, but the one that actually is on Jaeger itself. So instead of adding the plugin on every route that I want to observe, I add it by default to every route. That is this global rule means. And then I, I don't enable it on the places where I go to Jaeger because I don't want to observe what I'm doing with Jaeger. That doesn't make any sense. Something important, in general, you want to sample. You don't want to observe every request. Here it's a demo, so I don't want to send 1,000 requests to get one trace. <laughs> so here I sample everything, but in general, you want to have a small sample. And finally, you can like configure this open telemetry plugin. There are many, many configuration par parameters available, but here I want just to add additional data. So I want to add the route ID, the request method, and here I want to trace the HTTP header, X hotel key, which I didn't pass. So if we check this request, we can see that we have the route ID, we have the request method, but we have no header. So let's do it again with the header, curl uh, h, and it's x hotel key, hello jcon, and it's http local hosts, no, local hosts, uh, 9080, and products. Did I make a mistake? No, I don't think so. Yes. So now if we get back to Jaeger UI, we find the trace again. Now we have two traces. Of course, the second one is much faster. And then we can check. And on the API, API, API 6 side, now we have the hello on stuff. So you can trace these additional attributes. And every like component has those attributes by default. So depending on the component, you have like stuff that I didn't ask for. Like for example, here you have the thread name. Okay, I will switch it off and on again. Not to make it work this time, just to show you now manual instrumentation. Now we want to do better. With Rust, it's the case already. We are already coupled, we cannot uh, do more, but on the Spring Boot side, we can do better. So I will start it again, docker compose up, not ip up. So now I want to add additional traces inside. I want to customize the name of the spans inside. So I have this annotation based stuff. So in this case, however, I add to couple myself with an additional dependency, only for the annotations. Um, between you and I, uh, I tried to do it with the API. It doesn't work that well so far. So I will probably continue working on it. So with the annotations, we already uh, can do a lot, I believe. And here we have this like with span. So now I can like customize the name of the span that is shown inside uh, of the Uger UI. And here I can add an additional one and I can add also additional data as well through annotations. So here, for example, I want to show that uh, the, the product ID that I'm looking for. And that's where, that's the limit of the exercise because I'm using annotations, so I need to pass it as a parameter whereas I already have this information here in the product. So I need to change the signature of the method just to be able to like check it, which is not that great, but again, the API doesn't work so well so far, so I'm happy with that. And if I again do a curl, the same curl as before, 
So we had uh, 20 spans before. So, mm, so 20 spans here. So if I find the trace now, we have 27 spans. So I have added additional spans. And here we can see those are the ones that I've added. Uh, I also added a new one in Python. So I can also see in Python, like the request that I'm making with the product ID that I'm looking for, which is, you should be like product ID where I here. No, it's not this one, sorry, it's this one, yes. So here ID one, but on the catalog sites, well, you see everything that is, uh, those are the ones that I, I wanted, like repository, find all, catalog, select, test DB product, fetch and fetch detail. So I have everything that I want. If you want to have even more detail, either you need to change your uh, signatures, which I don't like, or to use the API, which again, I had trouble using so far. On the Docker file side, well, now it's exactly the same. We don't need to change anything. There is still this Java agent. It's just that now the Java agent is able to read the, the, the annotation and to send more data at the right places. So that's why I told you before, you can start with auto instrumentation, gives you a lot of insight already. If you need to customize, then just customize, but then it's an additional burden on your devs. It's up to you. And well, that's all folks. So open telemetry for the win. You don't want to do distributed systems without observing it. Metrics, I think it's done. Just aim for higher level metrics, metrics that can talk to the business. Logging, I sent you a lot of questions. For example, the most obvi obvious one is just don't like output for human readable, output for JSON, and then put everything into a log aggregation system. And for tracing, just use open telemetry. Actually, you can use open telemetry for all three of them. Um, but I wanted to like focus on distributed tracing because it's the thing that I believe is the most overlooked. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Mastodon. If you want to have the sources for uh, the demo, everything is on GitHub. On, on, so it's a GitHub link. I just want to like check how many people are actually looking at the repo. In general, there are not that many, but still, I still provide it. And if I got you interested in API 6, please have a look at our website. And now we have, I was fast because it's lunch time. We have a couple of time for uh, a bit of time for questions. Yes. I, I have, uh, uh, may I interrupt you? Everything that comes before the bot doesn't exist. Yeah, but it doesn't exist because you say bot. So the question is, it works well for HTTP because of the, of the double free uh, C uh, specification. But when we have asynchronous communication, such as queues or Kafka or whatever, how does it work? The answer is Hotel provides the tool to do it. I didn't play with it yet. I cannot tell you how good it is, if it works, if it's experimental, whatever. I just know that the concept exists. And yes, you can still see the trace across asynchronous calls. Yes. So 
So the question is about the impact of observability on performance. So I, I have several answers to that. I started, I, I was always interested in, in, in observability, even like a long time ago. So when, when Spring Boot added the actuator, I did a talk about the Spring Boot actuator that allows you that there are some observability endpoints. And I mostly always had at least a question like, how much is the impact on performance? How much? And my, my fun answer was, hey, is it better to go very fast with your eyes blindfolded or... So that's the first answer. It's funny, but it doesn't answer your question. But still, it's always better like to observe what you are doing. Second answer is the instrumentation is not that a big issue. The issue, if you want to limit the impact on performance, that you can only like check by yourself in your own infrastructure is the sampling that I've shown at the beginning. That's the most important part. That's why I, 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 I told you like the entry point is the most important part because it's the one that will impact your performance. So I turn on the, the whole sampling for the demo. Depending on, on, on your, actually on your load, you might want to tune it like for one every 10, one every thousand, one every thousand. The more traffic you have, yeah, the smaller the load you want on your system and the smaller the sample you want because you will have enough anyway. But how much it impacts, I cannot answer. You need to check it inside your own infrastructure. So the question is whether it's like more business savvy to have manual traces versus automated traces. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I, for once, don't think that the business side of traces is very important, in my opinion, at the moment. I think that distributed tracing is very interesting to observe at the moment on the technical level. Because you have a distributed system, it can break, you need to know where and why and whatever. That's the reason why I would say probably I would go for automated traces first. If you believe in your context, we, I don't know that it's better to have like business level traces, then go for it, that's for sure. But just remember, that the cost and the burden on developer is going to be higher. I don't know if you had like teams of 20 developers just for logging. It was hard for everybody to have the same level of logging in their, w in their code. As an architect, it's really a burden. Now, if you add like tracing on top of it, I'm not sure you will get the result that you want. Some pieces of the component will be very well traced according to your specification, some others might not. If you have a big team, not great. If you have a small team with like obedient and senior developers, might be a, might be a good idea. I, it depends on your context in that case. For me, as a generic advice, go for auto-instrumentation, no cost, do it and be done with that. So the question is like uh, condition-based sampling. Um, so it depends on your components. Um, I know, for example, on Apache API 6, you can activate some plugin based on some condition, uh, which need to be described with YAML, so you don't have the right stuff 
well, you cannot do it, but it depends a lot on the components. But I believe you can do it based on a header quite easily. I need to check, but I say mm, the chances are higher than 50%. But I didn't try, but I think it's possible. So the questions now is how do you like search and query your traces? And the answer is very simple. It depends on the component. Again, here I'm using Jaeger. As I mentioned, I'm not an expert on that. I just use the image because it's the most uh, easy one. So sorry, it's the easiest one. Uh, however, I, I've, I've seen um, uh, a, a demo um, at FOSDEM, where the guy was using the full distributed, uh, the, the full observability stack with uh, the Grafana stack. So they had um, matrix, logging, so Mimir, uh, Loki, and um, Tempo. And they were able to go from one to the other. So instead of searching the traces, they were searching the logs, and then they will say click, and then they will display the trace. That's one of my ID, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on all those systems, those backend, so um, it took me a bit of time, and I still didn't achieve it. So if, if somebody is willing to contribute to that, then uh, be my guest. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, it's lunchtime, starts to be hungry. Thanks a lot for attention. I will be there perhaps for one or two more hours. Afterwards, I need to catch my plane, but if you've got more questions and you were too shy to ask, just come to me and otherwise I have stickers and uh, guten appetit. <laughs> <laughs>